to state uh, where they are for the record, why their attendance is not in person, and uh, whether or not you can hear the proceedings. So we'll start with uh, Vice Chair Aaron Saris, please. Um, I was hoping it wouldn't start with me. So why why I, I, we're doing this remotely? What is COVID-19. COVID-19 is Oh, a that's the answer. Okay. <laughs> so, Aaron Saris, um, we're, uh, I'm in my home uh, due to COVID-19, and I can hear fine. Is that all? That's great. Karen, you're next. I'm in my home um, because the world got COVIDed, and I can hear just fine. All right. Uh, Allison? I'm in my home because of COVID-19, and I can hear fine. All right, Becky. I'm also in my home because of COVID-19 and I can hear fine. All right, and this is Ken Haig. I'm also in my home due to COVID-19 and I can hear as well. All right, so our next item is agenda adjustments, if there are any. The only thing I'd like to do at the end of the meeting is to discuss when the board would like to meet again. Okay. Do we need to do a motion to do that or is that... Very good. Well, it's just more of a discussion topic, but I just didn't want people to adjourn the meeting and we don't have a date or, or a time. Okay. Thank you. Dan, are you going to do a wrap for us or anything today, or should I not add that? <laughs> I can't hear you, but I'm sure it was good. <laughs> All right. Um, let's move. Are we going to do public input up front? Um, well, we have a nomination. That I wanted uh, Bob to take care of. We have um, a bringing forward a special ed uh, coordinator, the administrative position. So, Bob, you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, I would like uh, to nominate uh, Amanda Morin uh, to be the uh, special education administrator uh, for the 2020 2020 school year. And I would like um, to start her at a salary of $84,000 per year. Could you just go over a little bit about the process, Bob, and, and the person's background? Sure, absolutely. So uh, many of you may know Amanda. Uh, she's been serving in the capacity uh, for a number of years as our uh, school psychologist. Um, with the um, recent, uh, the, the upcoming vacancy with the Brookline um, Special Ed Administrator position, uh, she did express interest in that position. Uh, we did uh, run a process. Um, and we had a representative group of uh, stakeholders uh, serve on the screening committee. Uh, we screened several applications, um, interviewed a, uh, a small number of candidates, and uh, through that process, uh, Amanda emerged as the leading contender. Um, she had unanimous support from, uh, from the screening committee, and uh, I'm happy to, uh, to bring her name forward. Uh, she's a very talented school psychologist, and I think she will um, round out um, our student services team quite well and, and um, be a major contributor to our, to our administrative team as well. Awesome. Um, I, so as you know, this is my first time doing this and I don't see a motion around this in the meeting minutes that were sent out. So I'm not sure what to, what to state here. And you can't hear Sorry about that, folks. Still can't hear you. I can I can ad lib for a motion to accept the nomination. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, Bob, if you would just repeat the person's name, the position, and the salary, um, then that can be so moved. Amanda Morin for the Brookline Special Education Administrator position at an annual salary of $84,000. So um, moved. Oh. Second. Perfect. So I think we need to take a roll call vote. So Aaron, you're going to start us every time. Okay. Aaron, I. Aaron. Aaron, I. Allison. Allison, I. Becky. Rebecca, aye. Ken, aye. Super. That's it for nominations, resignations, and correspondence.
Okay. Um, so we, in our agenda, we had uh, public input. Do we, are we gonna open that up now um, and then move to our principal's reports? Yes, Bob can handle the public input. Okay, great. Yep, so if there's any member of the public that would like to speak, uh, please uh, click on the participants uh, button at the bottom of your screen and you can raise your hand and uh, we will call on you. Uh, right now I have uh, Eric Power who has his hand raised uh, to provide public comment. All right, go ahead, Eric. You can hear me now? I can, yep. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody's effort in remote learning uh, for the Brookline School District for our students. I know it's been challenging and it's also been challenging in our community. We have a, a much higher unemployment rate than we did two months ago. And there's a number of people in the community that are um, having trouble making ends meet. And I just wanted to uh, ask the board to consider what uh, savings you can have. There's probably some opportunities for savings here in the, this school year to uh, lower our taxes to help those that have been affected from a job loss or a job reduction over the past uh, few months because we're not gonna recover from this very quickly. And um, I just would like to know if there was opportunity to save money on buses or uh, utilities, anything else that we might be able to save money on if you can uh, uh, address that or bring that up on what we might be able to do and, and uh, make a larger uh, unreserved fund balance at the end of the year to return to the taxpayers, I'd appreciate that. And the other, other point I wanted to make was, um, I see a, an agenda item to give the uh, superintendent power to hire and uh, terminate employees, but I would wonder why you need to do that if the school district can still, school board can still meet, why you would have to do that and have that sort of authority for the superintendent. So uh, thank you for listening and I appreciate your, uh, your, your, your comments. Okay, um, I, I think the, the power, the, regarding the second one, traditionally we have not met in the summer. And I think at the end of the discussion, we're gonna talk here about meeting frequency uh, due to remote learning and um, the COVID impacts. So that I think we'll probably have to take that topic on as part of that conversation. Um, regarding the first piece, uh, I think we all appreciate that sentiment and um, respect what you're saying. And I think it's something that we're keeping an eye to uh, balancing th the budget as well as the, uh, the, the what we're providing um, to the students. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any other feedback on that, but I, I, I certainly, Eric, appreciate the feedback and, and share uh, and appreciate where you're coming from. And we might be all on mute, so it might be hard. Bob, is there any other public input? Uh, I do not see uh, any other public uh, comment. At this point, uh, we're gonna touch on a couple of those points that Eric made later in the meeting. So if you wanted to move forward uh, with the principal's reports and hand it over to Dan and Dennis, I think that uh, would be appropriate. Okay, very good, thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. It's hard to even know where to begin. It's, it's quite literally a whole new world for us in the Brookline School District and in school districts across our state and nation. Um, our educators have transformed learning uh, over the last handful of weeks in ways that we never could have anticipated um, a couple of months ago. Um, obviously, um, the whole world anticipated the possibility of COVID-19 becoming a pandemic and affecting us in significant ways. Um, as it turns out, um, your school district has responded fantastically well to the challenge. Uh, the administrative team across the district have had ongoing meetings to plan, to coordinate, and to um, make important decisions that affect what our remote learning program has come to be. Your teachers, of course, have been working tirelessly 
Uh, many would probably tell you if you ask them, they're working harder now than at any other time, but between now and their first year of teaching, the amount of hours that they're investing in this is, is really um, sensational. I couldn't be more proud of them and the way that they've stepped up to this challenge very selflessly. Um, Dan and I can go over a number of bullet points that you saw probably in the uh, agenda packet um, that you know kind of will bring a little bit more uh, color uh, to you know what has occurred in specifics. Um, Dan, should I start rolling on this and you jump in whenever you'd like or how would you like to proceed? You sound great, keep on going. Okay, we had an opportunity and we'll be as brief as we can, but we do wanna to touch on each of these points because they are very significant to what, what we've been undertaking in the last six weeks. Um, we, let's see, I think it was, um, I, I won't even remember the day, I'll say the 13th. Um, it was a Friday afternoon about 2.30. Um, you know, the decision was made that, that we would move to remote learning full time. And um, teachers and students and, and others in the building made a quick transition, got the kids home safe and sound, and then began right away making plans over that weekend for what remote learning would look like when we were able to, to reopen in that way. Um, teachers had two days of professional development and team meetings. Um, gathering resources from their classrooms and basically staging what we anticipated, you know, learning from home would be. And then they were able to launch on Wednesday the 18th. So now it's been about six weeks uh, that they have been at it. And um, yeah, people are getting tired. I think kids, parents, and uh, the <laughs> teachers, uh, but still we're continuing to march on and provide a high quality product and level of service to the community. One thing that has definitely been one of the more colorful aspects of our program has been morning announcements, at least for RMMS. Um, Mr. Molinari has put together um, a, a suite of daily announcements that has really been something I think the entire community has been looking forward to, school, uh, students across both schools and um, faculty and community members alike. Um, at CSDA, it's a little bit more dry. It's kind of a standard fare, uh, maintaining normalcy. Um, but nonetheless, um, that is a way that kids have an opportunity to start each and every day. They're also greeted by their teachers, as those of you who are parents know, um, by a whole stream of announcements, enthusiastic and inviting announcements um, about what to expect in the coming day. Uh, the different Zoom meetings, we'll talk about that in a little bit. This is actual you know, personal meetings and whole group meetings uh, for the purposes of instruction, connecting, um, academic support, processing, you name it. Also, there are a number of assignments that are assigned through um, a tool called Google Classroom, part of the G Suite or Google Suite that we employ in our school district. Um, teachers are able to electronically then assign um, work for the kids to do, to monitor its progress in real time, uh, to write comments and exchange ideas about the work as it's being created, and then of course, students have an opportunity to submit it and then teachers have a chance to assess it at the end of that process. So kids are doing reports, they're doing projects, they are doing homework, they are um, having tests if I didn't mention that already, and very soon we'll be doing progress reports. Um, so school is as normal and as consistent to our regular norms as possible. However, of course, in a very different setting using a different uh, collection of tools. I'll talk about Zoom meetings next. Um, this is a highlight of the kids' days um, and the teachers too, an opportunity to see just as we are now, kids and teachers face-to-face -face doing the work of learning. Um, and for the kids, this, this is important. Some of them don't have a whole lot of interaction outside of these Zoom meetings, certainly not with their classmates or teacher. So that is something that I think gives them a lot of stability and also um, a comfort. And uh, so I really praise our teachers they're doing two, three, four, five meetings a day, every day um, with their classes. And they're also reaching out to parents, uh, in some cases using Zoom. Um, the teachers, as I've said, have, um, we've set up a whole slew of remote learning web pages. Um, some of them are the Google Classroom sites, but also our specialists have sites and our nurse and our school counselor, the school office does. And this is like a whole other or parallel system of websites and information uh, for families and for the community about what we're doing with remote learning. Um, our meal programs, 
are ongoing. There are a lot of uh, families in the community who need uh, would benefit from continued uh, support um, through um, school lunches, breakfast, and of course, End Hunger 68. So those programs are alive and well and functioning on a regular basis for our families in need. Uh, it's one way the school district has been able to contribute. Um, we've had some special events. Perhaps I could pass the baton to you, Mr. Molinar, to talk about your uh, virtual talent show and STEM activities. Sure. Um, I first um, like to share, you know, Dennis covered a lot there and nice job, Dennis. Um, we really just appreciate all of the efforts that our teachers have, have done over this time. Um, they've just done a tremendous job um, collaborating as Dennis shared um, through PLCs and Zoom meetings. Um, they've really put forth a remote learning program that is just second to none. Um, and we're very proud of all of our staff. Um, and also we wanna thank the families too, because we know that this is really, really a challenging time, but it really does take a village and we appreciate all of the support from the families at home. And um, certainly if there's anything we can do going forward, reach out to us, but our families have, this is a challenging time, but they've done a really great job trying to keep up with what we're doing and students have been working so hard. So we're proud of all of our students um, and we appreciate the support of the families. Um, and we've tried to just keep our days um, simulated as close to normal as possible. Um, in terms of the virtual talent show, um, Shannon Sinclair has kind of had, um, headed this, uh, this activity where we've had students submit uh, virtual uh, or talents virtually to her. And on Friday evening, she's going to be sharing a link um, that will be posted on our website and families can uh, click on it, grab some popcorn, enjoy the uh, virtual show. Um, and we had a lot of participants um, and it's gonna be great. So we appreciate that. We're also looking at other virtual activities that we can do school-wide or, or throughout our district. Um, Dennis did touch a little bit about this with Zoom meetings, but our staff are collaborating weekly um, through PLCs, and those discussions are very, very rich. They're a continuation of the discussions we've had throughout the school year. Um, so we haven't lost any momentum with those discussions. Um, we're talking about um, you know, our planning, our, the activities that we're doing going forward, how we're supporting families. Um, they're just very, very um, great talks and our staff has um, just done so well with the collaboration piece as they usually do. Um, student services, um, this they've been working extremely hard. Um, and as Dennis shared, our teachers are on Zoom calls throughout the day. And the same is with our case managers. We are constantly doing whatever we can to support our students that have those additional needs that they need serviced. Um, and just, you know, a shout out to all of our case managers as well for just, you know, doing the best they can during these times to provide that extra support to our students. Um, and in terms of communication, we continue to uh, share our weekly newsletters. Um, those are posted on our website and we also send those through an alert. Um, you can also probably find some things on Facebook too because everybody gets their news there now. Um, and then uh, Dennis, do you wanna talk a little bit about the uh, attendance grading after I, we are doing progress reports. Progress reports are going out on Tuesday throughout the district. Um, so those will be in place. Um, we're tracking participation. Um, we've got guidance counselors, administration, um, keeping in touch with teachers to see who are those students that maybe need a little push to, to get their work going, you know, and getting going with their work. But I will tell you that the participant rates are outstanding. We are having full participation at our school and Dennis, if you want to talk a little bit about your school, that'd be great. Sure. I sure will. I will admit that I think there's been a, a slight drop in participation and student engagement this week. It's like the kids have a sense. It's like um, almost like instinctual. It's April break time. So I don't know. They might be cutting themselves a little bit of slack. But our teachers and many of our students are really staying right with the program. Um, hopefully we'll get everybody back for next week. We'll get right back on track and be as productive as we can be. Um, we have paid a lot of attention to monitoring attendance and student engagement. Um, over the course of um, remote learning, one of our prime goals has been to maintain a connection with our students. Um, we feel a responsibility. Of course, we have deep caring for them. Uh, it's important to us that they participate, that they show up at our Zoom meetings, that they are um, engaging with our Google Classrooms, picking up assignments, completing assignments, submitting assignments that they are um, participating in some of the chats that are going on um, in the threads that they have in Google Classroom about the, the class activities and whatnot. 
Um, that is really, I think, the primary goal um, of us here. We obviously want to get a lot of learning done. Uh, we know that you know this situation is not normal. This is not normal school. We can't realistically expect that our students will achieve academically to the levels that they had when we had face-to-face. -face. But we're doing our very best uh, under these circumstances. Like I said, I think we're making um, gains that we can be proud of. Um, but you know, with that, really, the main priority is just making sure that we maintain contact. Um, I hope that uh, the parents here um, in our audience or on the school board could attest that our teachers have spent a lot of time communicating with parents too. And teachers have been communicating a great deal with one another. They're collaborating at higher levels than probably they have had in their career. As good as it usually is, we're essentially inventing everything as we go here. We're kind of building the aircraft as we fly it, as the expression goes. So there's a lot of deliberation about everything we do, including progress reports. At CSDA, we've had a lively discussion about progress reports, what that format should look like, what should we be reporting on and how. Um, so that's just an example. Our reports will be going out on Tuesday, um, May 5th. That's about halfway through this trimester. And that'll help inform parents or just give one more checkpoint uh, of communication about student engagement and student progress. And we can build goals from there for concluding strong this school year. Dennis, I can take on the facilities piece to start us off. Does that sound good for you? It would be outstanding, Dan. Thank you. Sure. So for facilities, maintenance, and projects, um, just a quick shout out to all of our custodians that, that have been working in our district during this time. Um, you know, we are we do have protocols in place at both of our schools for, you know, wearing appropriate PPEs during this time and respecting social distance and, and what have you. Um, but they continue to keep the momentum going forward in terms of our projects. Um, so thank you for their efforts. As we usually do around this time, we are um, gathering quotes from multiple vendors and companies so that we can um, analyze those quotes and bids um, so that we can move forward with the projects that we have. So that is in the works right now. At RMS, um, we have done a, a plethora of painting. Um, we've got a, a whole hallway painted. Um, our second third grade wing is now, um, we've continued the painting that we did down the first kindergarten wing um, a couple years ago. And now we've got the second third grade wing. So um, all of our hallways are close to being freshly painted. We have completed painting of three classrooms, and we've also painted all the bulletin boards around our school. And the reason for that is a couple of reasons. One, it looks really nice. Um, but second, it also saves on the backing of the, the bulletin boards. Uh, a lot of times you have that paper in the back that the teachers staple to, and um, this avoids having to purchase that, and they look, they look nice. So, And another nice change that we've um, implemented as well is we had ordered during the school year some touchless uh, paper towel dispensers and also automatic flushers for our toilets for several for many of our toilets around the school that have that and that will be I think a welcomed uh, change in our school just uh, knowing what we're going through and just trying to limit that exposure so we've we've improved some of our plumbing needs around the school uh, with those um, improvements so uh at CSDA, um, similar. Um, I'm a little envious of the plumbing gains that, that's been made at RMMS. It sounds awesome, Dan. Um, at our school, it's mostly been about painting. All of our hallways have been painted. All of our restrooms have been painted. Um, and they're going to start moving to classrooms for, for painting and cleaning. They've resurfaced a number of floors already and uh, got a big jump start on some of the work they would otherwise do during the summer, which will afford more opportunity for them to do projects that would otherwise not get done in a normal summer. So we're very proud of our custodians and how hard they've worked and the contributions that they have made during our school shutdown. That would conclude our principal's report. If there are any questions, we'd be happy to entertain them. Um, so I have one. So we may talk about it in the facility maintenance projects updates, but I know last meeting we had talked about the different continuous improvement opportunities that while this is disappointing, you know that the kids aren't in school, but there's a lot of CI opportunities with this. Painting obviously is one. Um, and Dennis, you just alluded to some of the other projects that we might want to get to. Um, what are some of those that, in addition to the painting, that we're looking to try to achieve and, and pursue over the course of the next few months? Thank you. In addition to the regular room cleanouts, the classroom cleanouts, and we won't really be able to get into that to the extent we'd like until after. Um, teachers have been through and students will be, you know, will receive their 
their materials, their belongings. That's another whole conversation. But basically, um, once the, the season really has closed, then the uh, custodians can really get going on the classrooms themselves. They will be looking to do projects such as, I don't know if you've noticed, the exterior doors at CSDA have been in need of repair. They're 20 years old. There has been quite a bit of corrosion. Um, to the extent that our custodians can save those door jams, they'll be doing that. But we will have, and we have budgeted some funding for some professionals to you know, replace or restore some of those door jams. They will be painting the exterior doors. Of course, they'll be washing windows. Uh, that's an annual affair anyway. Um, also, our gym bleachers um, are likely to be um, stripped and resurfaced or retreated. That's going to be an enormous project for them and one that they're not looking forward to, but it will make an enormous difference. It's, it'll be beautiful. Those, uh, those wooden bleachers at CSDA are pretty special. Those Thank are a couple of ideas. And um, for RMS, um, like I said, we're, get, we're doing some of our, our bidding right now, but we, um, some of the projects we're looking at are improvements with our exterior lighting. We have some window upgrades that we need to um, attend to. We have an air handler replacement and we have our last boiler that we need to replace as well. And we are also looking at getting some bids for our cameras, uh, exterior cameras around the school as well. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you both for that thank detail. Uh, I think we'll move over to the discussion piece. So our first item of discussion is transportation. Yeah, I just wanted to provide the uh, board with an update. We've been working with the uh, Student Transportation of America. Uh, they have provided us a detailed spreadsheet that breaks down uh, the different components that we pay for on a monthly basis. Uh, we sent that over to legal counsel yesterday and have a conference call on Monday to go through that so that we can determine exactly what the district owes for the bus contract. Um, to give you an example, we have always purchased the fuel separately. We don't have that in our contract. We worked with local vendors on that. So obviously all of those costs will be saved. So there'll be a number of items like that. It is a uh, complex matter because of the CARES Act, uh, because there are components in the CARES Act that we might be eligible for, but we need to make sure we stay into com compliance with the, the total CARES Act. Uh, and that is why we sent it over to legal and we'll have more detail and we hope to have a meeting probably mid-May, you know, about 10 days, two weeks from now. And that will come back to us in a more um, concise form that the board will have in their packet and then can take a vote on regarding uh, what steps we take there. So that's the quick update on transportation. All right. I have a question. Um, just to follow up, does, with the CARES Act stuff, Andy, does that mean, you know, um, are, if anything were to happen with bus drivers, um, not being needed, that would fall on us, the district being out of compliance or is it just. That's what we're, we're checking on. I don't believe that will be the case in this situation because of the scope and size of Student Transportation of America. I don't think they qualify under the CARES Act, but the big element of the CARES Act, one that I think could be a cost to all three districts across the SAU, is the um, potential cost for special ed services that we may not be able to deliver. And those could um, become big dollars. So we're going to work to offset any of those costs. Uh, Bob's gonna give a, a sped update shortly, so I won't steal his thunder, uh, but I will compliment him and Amy uh, in their reducing of the risk. And I had a conversation, oh, it's about five or six weeks ago with Brian Rader from the uh, Brookline Finance Committee and Tad Putney. Uh, and we all agreed that we'd be looking at all item, items, purchase orders, all of those components to see what could be um, delayed, not done, uh, because I do believe that we need to look at this from a, a budget point of view in terms of what we carry over to help offset next year's tax rate, which the voters had passed prior to this taking effect. And we do intend to have a, um, a revenue and expense report in May that kind of will start outlining those for you and give you kind of really good projections of where we're heading. Excellent. 
Any other questions on transportation? The next topic is special education updates if there are no transportation. Okay. okay. Uh, so first of all, I wanna thank um, all of uh, the individuals that work in student services, our case managers, our counselors, our nurses, related service providers and our paraeducators. I, I would argue, I, and you know, Mr. Molinari, uh, Molinari alluded to this, that you know, um, our staff, they're working really harder um, than they ever had before. And as a result of that, we really see a continuity of services being provided to our um, special education students. Um, in fact, in the vast majority of cases, we are able to um, provide the same level of service that we would provide um, in the physical environment. And this is important um, for the obvious reason of, you know, we want to improve student outcomes and student learning, but also, you know, we are obligated to provide those services and um, we could potentially expose ourselves to a tremendous amount of liability in our failure to do that. So the more that we can do now, uh, the less that we might owe some, sometime down the road when we return to the, to the school environment. Um, so, you know, you'll see our students are receiving speech services and their OT services and their specialized reading programs. And, um, you know, we've just moved into the remote environment. So those services are being provided through Zoom uh, very effectively, um, both individually and in small groups. Uh, we've also, you know, recognized that, you know, there are some challenges for remote learning um, for both our regular ed students and uh, particularly for students uh, who have a disability. And so, you know, where appropriate, you know, we're able to provide um, some supports um, to students in addition to what they'd be receiving only in attempts to not have these students regress. Um, so I, I really want to um, say thank you to, to all of the members of student services, but particularly I, I want to recognize the work of our paraeducators who are working very hard in a short amount of time. You know, we've created a model that provides for individual and small group support. You know, we have a lot of paraeducators spending their day hopping from one Zoom meeting to another Zoom meeting um, to support students um, in this time of, of remote learning. Uh, the other thing that we're working on is um, our summer uh, ESY program. Um, again, our extended school year program is for um, students with disabilities who we have uh, identified as having possible regression if we do not provide support in the summer. So as of right now, we are planning um, tentatively, of course, we need to know what the last day of school is first, but our tentative plan is to run our, our uh, ESY program from June 29th uh, to August 14th. This is a, a um, extension of ESY uh, by two weeks. Um, this is important because under normal circumstances, we typically uh, start ESY two weeks after the end of the school year. And this is important, um, and there's a research to support this, that any longer than two weeks, you could be looking at regression. And knowing that the start of our school year actually doesn't start until September 3rd, that's why we extended at the end as well. Um, so th this will provide greater opportunities for our students um, in the progress towards their goals. And again, this will re re help to reduce the obligation that would be owed to them when uh, we exit remote learning and return to the regular school environment. Um, so with that said, I'll open it up to any questions that you might have uh, relative to special education and student services. Okay. All right. All right, so thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Next topic is remote learning update. Uh, I think we had some questions on this one uh, in our board before setting the agenda around curriculum plan for the fall and contingency planning for the next school year if we were to see a spike here. Um, so thank you for the update here. Sure. Um, so I want to start off by sort of echoing some of what Dan and Dennis and Bob have said. Can't say enough about how well we have all adapted to remote learning from the teachers, to the administrators, to the students, to the families, um, support staff. Um, we've just done a remarkable job. And um, that was sort of evident in the survey that was sent out. Um, it was sent out in the morning of April 2nd, and I closed that at night of uh, April 6th. We had nearly 49% participation across the SAU. And there was some really critical feedback 
um, that we receive. Um, lots of positive, but lots of areas and great suggestions for improvement. Every single comment was read. Um, it was, I divided up by building, by grade level, et cetera. And I had individual conferences which, with each building principal. And we developed implementation plans that were specific to each building. And um, I have to say that these, it's, it's difficult, can be difficult to receive some critical feedback, um, but these plans demonstrated a willingness for our teachers and our administrators to receive the feedback, to grow, to learn new things, and to implement. We've responded to just about every concern out there and we've, and we've grown. And really the attitude is, um, you know, with every piece of feedback, it's an opportunity for, for professional growth. And we've really um, have been able to identify um, specialists within our own teaching faculty and um, make connections of who can help each other out and really improve what we're doing. And the feedback since then has been, you know, really appreciative of the changes, a lot of just small tweaks, um, changes that were made, that were made. I have to say that um, Brookline, um, both RMS and CSDA have been doing an absolute phenomenal job. Um, and the survey certainly suggested that and um, really have been models for the, for the, for our district, but also for other districts. I mean, folks are looking for, uh, looking to us because they know that we do things well and remote learning is certainly just one example. Um, but on to curriculum planning. So now that we are, depending on when the last day of school is, roughly halfway, um, a little bit more, hopefully, halfway. Um, and we see that that last day of school is somewhere in the future. We really have to sit down, teachers and administrators in PLCs, and have um, really intentional conversations about the curriculum, where we are, where we typically are, what we're going to cover completely, what we're going to cover, but maybe with not as much depth, and what um, curricular areas are just not going to be addressed this year. And, and we do this every year. This is not something new. We just expect that our conversations at the end are going to be a little different this year than in other years. Um, and then we begin to analyze what that looks like. And, you know, for those of you not 100% familiar with curriculum and how it's written, it, it spirals through. So it's intended to be addressed sort of year after year, or every couple of years, so that the second exposure so it has the ability to call upon prior learned facts and then um, go a little bit deeper. So because it's set up that way, it really makes this process um, not so daunting. You don't have to just cram you know, a trimester or a month of, of learning into the next school year. Really, we um, take a look at the, the topics that we need to um, address. Let's say they weren't covered in fourth grade, maybe we need to take a look at fifth grade and how we're going to incorporate them. And you know, time will be spent thinking about what's the best way to do this, not just add more days or add more hours, but how do you do so in a way that's meaningful and um, efficient and uh, will receive you know, the best results in the end. And we do this every year, um, but this is just expected to be a little bit different this year. Um, and then next comes the process of planning for next year. So we're planning for for um, option A, B, C, D, and everything in between. Because, you know, I never thought I'd be in this situation where we're doing this remote learning, but here we are and, and we're managing. So what does it look like when we return to school and, and that's typical? What does it look like if we return to school and it's remote? What does it look like if we return to school and it's some version in between, um, you know, a hybrid model? So we're, we're making plans for all of those what ifs and trying to figure out how to do that. How do you open a classroom potentially in the remote environment and develop that, that classroom community? You know, it was a challenge to leave the classroom, but you knew the teacher, you knew your classmates, you had an understanding of routine. How do you start a year that way? And so if we end up going that, in that route, we're, we're really going to be dedicating some solid professional development on how to, how to create a community in the remote environment. Um, and that'll look a little different than kind of closing out the school year. I certainly hope for uh, so many reasons that, that we're not there, but time will tell, certainly. Um, and, you know, like as we learn more about the restrictions that are in place, that'll just further inform the required planning and professional development that we'll be requiring. So that's about it. 
So thank you. Um, the contingency planning, I think is, I appreciate what you said on the other things. I, I kind of assumed, well expected, that's what you'd be doing with the curriculum development. So appreciate that. Contingency planning is, is new, um, knowing the different variables are out there. And I'm just wondering, like, is there, is there a thought that there could be opportunity for half the class size with social distancing and we do that kind of thing where and like one week on one week off remote versus in class and the other group switches and things like that um and then what about like if i don't know we don't know we, i don't know if there's enough data on covid yet to know whether the winter makes it worse better or it doesn't matter but what if we we're we're in a classroom environment and we move immediately to remote three months in like i'm I, based on what you said, I'm thinking you're probably playing out those scenarios, but I, I guess I just wanted to state it and ask the question and get your feedback on that. No, we're definitely considering, like I said, plan A, B, C, D, and everything else. Um, you know, I wouldn't typically say luckily we start so late, but we do start much later than um, the rest of the country. So some states like California that starts often the second week of August, they're developing those procedures and protocols for going to school Monday, Wednesday, half the class, and then remote on Tuesday, Thursday, and then the other half comes in Tuesday, Thursday, or um, no longer going to the cafeteria for lunch, but food is served in the classroom. Number of different um, ways of, of doing business in a hybrid model. So we're certainly considering all of these things. We're, we're taking information from you know CDC about what we need to be doing, but also we'll have the, the luxury, if you will, of having all those other districts and other states open up first. And we can sort of take that and learn learn from, you know, what's working and what's not working. Because what, you know, I think what's really important is consistency, whatever that is. Like we don't, I, I feel one strength of our district has been that we've really been thoughtful and tried to have a lot of conversations and. Um, forward planning so that we didn't have to make a decision and then um, two days later change, you know, do a 180 and completely change that. Um, that's hard on everybody, not just, um, you know, not just teachers or, or administrators. It's hard on families. It's hard on everyone. So we want to make sure that um, given the available information, we make the best decision and not have to kind of take a few steps backward. But time will tell, certainly. Thanks. So... I guess one of the questions that I'm, sh again, I'm, thank you for this update. I'm sure you've thought of all of these things and um, are giving us sort of the broad strokes, but I'm thinking about assessment and, um, you know, if we reach a point in the fall where the students aren't returning to school, or even if they are, but if, um, you know, recognizing that some students will have experienced this and have different, bigger gaps than others, um, and how that might inform um, or change the way we've typically done things. I know differentiation, you know, happens anyway in the classroom and that will continue, but it'll be interesting to see the data and um, what the outcomes have been after this time. And there could be positive outcomes that can inform curriculum, things that the students are doing that they, you know, wouldn't have thought to do before and that have seen great results. So, you know, how we're going to collect that information and and use it moving forward. You know, that's um, definitely really important. And as you said, you know, we're already differentiating. Um, we potentially will have to do a little bit more differentiation. We, we have our um, in-district assessments that we always use. We have our, you know, NWEA. We have a lot of different tools that we will be using to kind of figure out where we are and how to best meet the needs of all of our learners, as we always do. But this time, we're going to go in it with the expectation of we might see, uh, you know, a bigger, um, um, just, a, you know, a wider range of, um, of students and, and where they are. An interesting point that you um, alluded to is some of our students are actually thriving in, in this environment. And I'm really focused more, that comment's really uh, more about some of our co-op older students who just can't do the school environment. But now that they are kind of on their own time at their own pace, in the evening, let's say, they're really just participating at a much higher percentage than when they were you know, asked to go to school from, from 7 to 2.30. So it absolutely will be interesting to see you know, what happens when we come back. Um, and, and we have um, you know, expectations that some kids are exactly where 
you know, where they should be. And some kids will maybe have regressed and some kids will have excelled. And, you know, that also happens in any year, regardless. Some kids just have an, a year of tremendous growth um, intellectually. Just they're at that, their, their brain is prime for learning at that time. And then, you know, then there, there's like a physical growth spurt and that kind of takes away from their um, intellectual growth spurt. And that just happens with, with typical development. So we're always kind of monitoring kids and where they are. And, um, you know, this year we're just going to do it a little differently. I mean, you know, Dan has had to figure out, well, what is it going to look like for kindergarten screening? Because we're not doing screening in May. So it's a really different process. So how do you do placement without the screening? And how do you get that information as soon as possible, but without um, foregoing that developing of the classroom community in kindergarten when it's potentially their first exposure to the classroom? So all of these are being thought of and considered and really um, um, lots of attention is being paid to them. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next topic is school breakfast prices for next year. Yes, um, under deliberation tonight, we have an action item for the board. Um, this is simply the cost of mainly fruit is going up. So we're looking to increase the breakfast meal only. Our lunches will remain the same. The breakfast will go up to $1.75. Uh, and that is because of our, our conscious decision to provide fresh fruit on a regular basis as part of our breakfast. It's a meal that has, has been growing every day. You know, a number of kids are taking advantage of that. And while I'm on the topic of meals, I just want to give a, a thank you to Amy Cassidy, who's our food service director. Uh, we continue to serve students on Mondays and Wednesdays. Those numbers have grown. Her and her staff have done a tremendous, tremendous job. Uh, on Mondays, a family can pick up four lunches, uh, breakfast, lunch combination for their children for Monday and Tuesday. And on Wednesday, you get six meals that get you through the rest of the week. And then I just wanted to make you aware of N68. Uh, they continue to work as a nonprofit and provide food for the weekends to families in Hollis and Brookline. Uh, there's a teacher in Hollis that volunteers on that. She is running a virtual 5K uh, to raise money for N68. She started that a few weeks ago. And so far they have raised $3,700 to offset the cost of the increases in food requests by our families. So there are just tremendous, tremendous things going on to support people. Uh, this slight increase to breakfast is just something we believe will keep the food service program in the black. If the food service doesn't finish in the black, it's required by law to be funded out of the operating budget. And that's something we try to avoid. So that is, I just wanted to give you that update, but it will come back up again under deliberations as a formal voting item. Okay, thank you. All right, so we touched on a little bit, but any further discussion on the facility maintenance projects updates? No, I, I just want to um, thank Dan and Dennis um, and our custodial staff. It, it's just been amazing uh, what has been getting done. Uh, we're delivering education. We're, we're taking care of buildings. We're getting to things that desperately need to be done uh, that we typically don't have the time for. So this to me is a, you know, one of those long-term savings because these items of painting and boilers and all those things are going to have to be done. Uh, but by Dan and Dennis's coordination and, and hard work and due diligence, they're taking place and will be um, in much better shape and hopefully start to be able to reduce some maintenance items going into future budgets. All right, our next topic, any any further questions? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, next topic is transition plans for the new principal of CSTA. Judy, you want to talk about this? Yep. Okay. Thank you. So um, the, the new principal of CSTA who will officially come on board July 1 um, has been in contact with me, has been in contact with Dan, and has started to set up meetings via Zoom, because that's all we do, <laughs> um, with Dennis. Um, she will obviously, once July 1st hits, um, have the 
help and support of, of everyone, but certainly Dan, as um, you know, they're on the same administrative team. And um, Dan will be the veteran member of that team with um, Amanda coming on board July 1 as well. Um, but I also have a mentor set up for her, a principal mentor, so that she has someone else in a different district with a different perspective that she can toss ideas back and forth with. And as Andy and I do with, with all of our administrators, we set up every other week meetings. Sometimes they're um, together as a district and sometimes they're separate. For the first year, I like to um, ensure that at least one of those meetings, uh, you know, every other one is individual so that, you know, if there's a question or more support that he or she would need, they wouldn't feel they had to say something in front of their colleagues. So um, that's also part of our evaluation system of how we work with them, what questions they ask, um, what, um, you know, how they problem solve. We really spend quite a bit of time with them throughout that process so we can kind of monitor their growth and um, their effectiveness. And I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, to working with her in the future. Great. Dennis, do you feel uh, that this was an odd end <laughs> finality? Yeah. With how, how are you feeling from a personal standpoint and transition standpoint with how things are going right now? Well, to be honest, it is it is very sad. It's very disappointing. It is the way it is. Um, you know, we've been all working so hard. It's been a tremendous distraction, actually. Um, but yesterday, I was at school and had a chance to walk around the dark, lonely hallways and saw classrooms that were pretty much exactly as they were the day that we left, because that's the way it is. People have not been coming in. You know, it was a little chilling and a little bit sad. It is what it is. Um, but, you know, I can't even begin to tell you how grateful and how fortunate I feel to have had the opportunity to work in your district with people like you. Um, this has definitely been a highlight of my career. It's been enormously gratifying. And, um, you know, I wish every school um, staff, I, I wish every student could have the opportunities that, that the kids in Brookline do. Um, they really, they, they are fortunate. We remind them of that, by the way quite a bit. Um, and uh, certainly I'm grateful for the opportunity to have been in Brookline and, uh, you know, I've been connecting with Trisha as well. I want to do everything I possibly can to help with her transition and promote her success as the next principal of CSBA. The school and community deserve it. And, um, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, CSBA will continue to be great, absolutely, as will the district. And uh, it's been great to be a part of it for as long as I have. And I thank you all for that. Thank you. Thanks for the update. And certainly thank you for all of your service and, and your dedication throughout. Okay. Any other comments or questions? No, nope. I, I kind of want to add one thing. I, I think, uh, you know, I mean, we'll probably talk about this later on the air, but yeah, Dennis has, this is unfortunate for Dennis to kind of leave Brookline this way. He, he's been outstanding for our, our district, just an awesome colleague. Um, he's definitely going to be missed, um, you know, by me, but our, our leadership team and our, our students and our families, the families love him, the kids love him, and he's made a great impact um, on everybody here, but especially me too. He's been a great uh, partner during this, um, during my tenure here so far. So thank you, Dennis. Awesome. Okay. All right, um, last item of uh, discussion is the transition plans for step up and movement to the new buildings. Gina, were you gonna jump in there? I'm ready. I didn't know who, who's gonna take this. I mean, I can talk about it. We've, we've been talking about this at our weekly leadership um, meeting. Certainly our, our primary focus, to be honest, is seniors who are graduating because that's a huge milestone that's gonna look very different. Um, but we are looking at, you know, what, what does it look like for a third grader to go up to CSDA for the first time? We don't have that step up day, um, you know, because we're, we're not in school. Um, what does it look like for the sixth graders to leave the Brookline School District um, in this fashion? And so we're, we're exploring all different possibilities um, including, you know, 
just, I mean, I don't, I don't want to spoil it or anything, but for seventh grade, they do have a, um, a registration day in August that's optional. You don't have to go, but we were talking about potentially making that team-based rather than just a free-for-all because typically there's a step-up day for those transitioning to middle school that is you go with your team. So half the sixth grade class from Hughes and half the sixth grade class from CSTA goes up and they, they um, meet each other for the first time and they meet all their teachers. And, you know, potentially we do that registration day by team. So they have um, a much later version of that, of that first meet and greet. Um, I know that um, Mr. Gerzone, principal of the middle school, is looking into making that open house for sixth grade parents um, a remote experience. So they still get just sort of like Dan created um, an, a, a great remote video for incoming kindergarten families because we don't have the day for them to, for them to come in and to meet all the key folks. So he did a great job creating a video that gave all the information that's necessary and then um, kind of led them in their way. So we're looking to see about providing that information in terms of a building tour remotely. A lot of different ideas have gone around. Um, you know, the, the question is the feasibility. There are teachers who um, are, are retiring and are not returning. So going back to your old classroom might not be possible. So what do you do with the class that is that doesn't have a teacher if you kind of started with your old class and then transition to the new class? We also have um, students who will be moving in over the summer as we always do. So what do you do for those students if you tried to do a, an arrangement where you started with your old teacher and then moved to a new one? What do you do with, with those students? So we want to be very creative and create a meaningful um, experience for our students where we can provide closure um, and really send off the students to their next adventure in um, a, a positive way. So um, I'm not sure, Andy, if you wanted to add more to that, but. I think we're looking at, I would say, anything and everything and trying to determine what would work. Uh, we have just wonderful families and wonderful kids. And it's really important if we can do something for our sixth graders because they're ending a traditional portion of their educational career. And we'd like to do something to recognize that. Um, we're having the same type of discussions as you can imagine around prom and graduation, because we have a wonderful group of seniors who have spent so many years. Um, you know, how do we welcome the next group who uh, comes into the district, you know, comes into fourth grade, because that's a, that's a big deal for kids. So we have, you know, a long way to go on that in terms of planning, but we meet uh, quite regularly, probably all too often right now. Um, and we will be coming out with some plans and probably updating you the middle of the month of some of the things we're thinking about and getting them out to the community. That's the other piece I can assure you uh, that if we get a little creative and we need assistance from our communities, we have it. They are more than willing to make something happen for these students because uh, they recognize it's, it's just a, hopefully a once in a lifetime uh, event. Um. Regarding the, the sixth grade piece and really um, others, would, would it be something that we consider, um, you know, I know Andy, you referenced community members being interested, but just reaching out to a small number of parents to kind of create, to, to both take a little bit off of your plates, but also to engage because this is something that, um, you know, a lot of the parents are um, really concerned with just to, to kind of, is this worth forming a small committee to brainstorm some of these ideas? Um, I know it sounds like you guys have thought out, thought through a lot of them um, and, and have a good start. Um, I think with like, I think the students need the closure in their, their old school, you know, and, you know, some component of that. Um, but I, I don't know how, I'm no, we don't know how feasible it is. We can't even talk about it with our kids because we, you know, we, we just don't know. But I just want to throw out there the possibility of putting a group together or a committee or something like that to, um, to flush some of these things out. Yeah, and I, I think we will get there. One of the things that I participate in uh, twice a week, uh, COVID-19 updates, and it, it does seem to be changing quickly again this time in a positive direction. So we may have a little more flexibility around you know, how many kids can meet. We're very fortunate at CSDA and RMMS, we have a ton of property. 
So if there were some things to be relaxed and we could use, take advantage of the property, again, I know we have more than enough volunteers that will assist and, and make something happen. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested to, to get to the 1st of May 4th deadline because I think we're going to get a different update then. And then uh, you may be aware Massachusetts extended their deadline to May 18th, so I wouldn't be surprised to see New Hampshire stay consistent with that just because of how many families would interact across the border from a work standpoint, not a school standpoint. Um, and I think more data will be coming forward because the other questions we need to ask are if we did something, would we need to take everybody's temperature? Would we need to have PPP for, for every student? So those are some of the questions that we have out there and we have out there as a state because obviously what we try to do will be replicated by probably the hundred other districts across the state. So it, um, it is definitely on the agenda. I think when we get it narrowed down to where we have, uh, what I'll say, a comfort level with you know, alternatives A, B, and C, and then I think a committee would be absolutely appropriate or a survey to find out what would best serve the needs of the community. Okay. Um, we did, Andy, you brought up one of the topic that might be worth discussing right now before we move to the deliberations around our next meeting. Um, just based on what you said there, and, and that kind of leads into some of the other things. Um, maybe we, we review that right now, and I'm just thinking out loud, but I know our state of emergency, like you said, well, New Hampshire state emergency goes till 515. Massachusetts extended stay at home till May 18th. Um, we're going to talk about end of the school year. Uh, I don't know if we want to talk about an hour after the fact, after we just decide the final day, but my, I was just thinking it might be worthwhile between that May 18th and early June to, to reconvene one more time, just based on a couple of these topics that we've talked about. It might not be a real long meeting, but um, a couple of these things seem pressing that might have updates in the next three weeks that we could meet as a board one more time before the finality of the school year. Yeah, I, I was actually um, going to throw out the date of May 13th which is now the Wednesday, uh, which is actually relatively quick, but I think things are gonna change relatively quick. And I'm not opposed to May 13th and then something at the end of the month too, because I think there's going to be uh, topics that are gonna come up as, as we head down this road. The, the question is um, selfishly, because we're, uh, we, we need to have somebody physically present and that's Bob and Rich are over at the middle school tonight. So I'm trying to keep the three board meetings on the same night, but I'm looking for some flexibility around times uh, because the Hollis district has taken the early slot, the last two, and two of their members are just having work commitments coming up and they don't have that flexibility for the next meeting. Okay, so are we proposing a May, 13, uh, May 13th time period then, Andy, if I heard you right? That's, that's the next proposal for the team? That, that's what I think would be good. It's about two weeks away, and I think it'll, I will probably have some, what I'll say, knowledge of where we're heading as far as opening and closing. Um, and, you know, what, what may be some flexibility around gatherings. Like, I mean, we might go from 10 to 25. Well, all of a sudden, if you can do a gathering of 25 kids, you could do a closing for the end of the year out in the field. You know? Yep. What is the early time slot on the meetings? Uh, it, you, you could set it. I mean, it, for us, it's just a matter of posting it on Zoom. I know Hollis one time did nine o'clock in the morning because they were able to do it before everybody got going. Uh, once we know the time, as long as we legally post it, it, it doesn't, you know, everybody's pretty much at home. I'm not saying everybody can take the time off work, but at least this way, everybody be aware of the meeting and Bob records them all so they are posted the next day. For example, today's meetings are three, five, and seven. Okay. But it, I was just curious. I actually have complete flexibility now. So I would be in favor of earlier because that's one of the uh, board webinar training at 6 30 that night, the right to know laws. So if, I don't know who's participating in that, but if we could have it earlier, that would be great. Uh, do, do you want to not set a time? We'll pick May 13th and then. Ken can connect with you all offline and determine what's best for your families. 
Sounds like a plan. Okay, we'll do we'll do that. Thank you. And um, just that rough idea, is it going to be like a roughly an hour meeting just so we have an idea? Because this one's a little longer than probably the next one. I could be wrong on that, but. No, I think we can narrow it down to probably just two or three essential topics. Uh, unless something drastically changed, I think it's going to be a couple of topics. I know I want to do transportation and a couple of other things like that. And I want to do the revenue and expense report the middle of the month so that everybody has it and it's out there for over a month. So if things change in June, we can, we can update in June. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I'm just going to, well, I'll email everyone. I'll throw it out there. If, if between 10 to noon works for people, maybe think about that. I'm looking at my work calendar and that is probably my best earlier in the day, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll discuss. Okay. Thanks. Okay, uh, so we're going to move to deliberations now, and our first item is around. Um, so this is new to me now. Do I do, do I throw the motion out and then we talk about it? <laughs> this is this is where I'm a, a little new territory. Yeah, in your uh, outline, Ken, Don yeah. would have provided you to with the outline uh, with the motion, so you could read the motion, then somebody can move it, and somebody can second it, and then we can have discussion. Perfect. Thank you. So we need a motion to authorize the superintendent to hire, accept resignations, and terminate staff during the months until returning to in-person school and require notification to the board of such actions. So Allison, Allison. on mute. Is there a second out there? Second. All right. Thank you. Uh, just to give you a little update, I, I don't disagree with Eric that we are going to meet more frequently than we have. This request is not necessarily coming from um, frequency. This request is becoming from a uh, very difficult hiring market. Um, we just encountered this situation in Hollis uh, where we had a candidate basically say to us, I need to know by before Friday if it's me or, or I'm accepting another job. Uh, the, the candidate pools of 25 to 30 applicants are just not happening anymore. Now. I will be honest, we don't have many openings in Brookline. I think it's a handful at best, probably less than that. Uh, the process starts with a building committee. So Dan and, and Dennis take care of those. And then they make a recommendation to Gina and I and Bob, the two candidates. And then uh, we usually do a second interview and then move the person forward. Um, so this is totally selfish. I just want to make sure we get the best person on the market. Uh, Traditionally, I have always updated the board on hires. If it was during the summer, it would be have been done via email because it wouldn't be convening. In this fashion, um, it would be uh, through Zoom. If I had somebody interviewing like May 11th, I could easily wait to the, the 13th. My problem is if, if a, a principal gave me a finalist on the 14th of May and we weren't meeting to the 29th, I don't want to lose that higher in what is going to be a very difficult market. And I would just add um, also, if you recall last summer, we had a, you know, a summer resignation because they um, were offered a promotion. So without the ability to accept the resignation, we can't post and advertise for the new position. So it just allows us to kind of continue the process in, in what has proven to be a challenging hiring environment. So I've always been a, fan of this motion um, simply because we set um, as part of our uh, budgetary cycle, our policies and everything, what the hiring plan is. And I certainly trust the administration to identify the best candidates. I don't think I have the understanding that you all do. Um, so I always support this and think that we stay within the plan of hiring, which which we have shown to be the case. This This makes sense. I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts. I agree. Go ahead, Erin. Yeah, no, and I, I also think that if, if we're if we do end up ultimately meeting more regularly than we typically do um, in the summer, I don't have any doubt that things are going to get pushed through before we meet. I, I, I trust that the administration will, you know, will go through the process in the most efficient way possible and be and keep us in the loop. Um, so, you know, I, I don't have any hesitation um, with with that either. Okay, so I'd like to move it to a roll call vote then. 
Um, I forgot my order, so I'm just going to read them off. Uh, Rebecca instead of Becky. <laughs> Rebecca, I. We emailed on this because I want to know the formality of what name she preferred. That was the joke. Um, Karen. Karen, I. Allison. Allison, I. Aaron. Aaron, I. Can I. So it moves 5 0. The next one is probably the big one of the day, the okay. last day of school. Uh, what I am proposing and recommending is what I'm going to call a tiered approach to closing. Uh, remote learning has gone very, very well. But at the same time, um, not every student has found it that easy. It might be bandwidth problems at home. It might be competing with siblings and parents for the computer. So there's been a number of things. So I'm looking at what I'm going to call a a, a final day of June 12th, which is the Friday in June, but the week of the 8th through the 12th will be for um, students who need to make up work, remediation, uh, special ed services, those type of things, as well as some classroom closures, whether that be a Zoom party, something like that. So the, the last formal day of what I would say I don't want to say new information, but the last formal scheduled day that we're running now would be June 5th. From a uh, CBA point of view, the last scheduled day, according to the CBA, is the 12th of June. I think we heard from Bob why that's very important for special ed students. Um, we will easily exceed, as we always do, the number of hours the state requires. We will meet the contractual number of days for our teachers. I think it's good for kids because I don't necessarily see us being out of this until probably after that. And I think that normalcy is good for the family. If, you know, if, if on May 13, when we meet, everything is opening up again, we can have another discussion. I'm just not sure what the benefit would be of, you know, reducing the number of days in a school year right now when we know some students are struggling with that. So it's kind of a tiered approach. Uh, we'd all be done during that time. We'll also figure out ways for kids to safely and securely drop off materials, pick up belongings. Uh, so there are a number of things that have to occur that week of the 8th through the 12th. Uh, teachers, I believe, are with us either to the following Monday or Tuesday for grades and their regular end of year functions. Um, so that's what I'm proposing, and I, I think it'll be good for kids. And the reason we're at that earlier date is because we are going to school this week and then we picked up approximately three instructional days because we're not doing state testing. So I'm really comfortable with, with the amount of instruction we're providing even in this different setting. Okay. Um, just sending a chat real quick. Okay. Um, thank you. So let's do a motion first. So motion to set the last day of 2019 school year as June 12th. So moved. Oh, June 12th. Is that oh, what June, you said? Yeah, June 12th. So moved. Sorry. Are you listening? <laughs> I was. I just had June. I had multiple dates in my brain. I'm only <laughs> kidding. I'm only kidding. All right. Thank you. Karen seconded. Thanks. All right. So discussion. So my one question is that we're still looking at June 5th as kind of like the final instruction day for kids if they've kept up with the curriculum. Right, Allison. I'm not looking for a new paper to be assigned or things like that. Uh, I really like, because to me that last week, as much as we can, I want it to be kind of that traditional winding down of the school year, some fun activities, uh, some virtual activities. Uh, but plenty of remediation, or even for those kids who may be in our uh, accelerated programs, their ability to finish out a topic, because for those kids, that provides some great excitement. Thank you. I think this is great. I'm glad we pulled it a little bit. Um, I, I think doing this week was nice and given a three-day weekend. And I, I, I don't know about everyone else, but I, my kids, I could, I'll take their earlier week personally myself. Any other uh, discussion on this? Or are we ready to move to a vote? 
Will this be a communication that comes from what a district wide communication, Andy, that comes from you as the others have? Yes, I, I will send out a notice and then Dennis and Dan will follow it up with their Friday principal's newsletter so parents will get it multiple times. Okay, great. Okay, move to a vote. Rebecca? Rebecca, aye. Karen? Karen, aye. Allison? Allison, aye. Aaron? Aaron, aye. And aye. Thank you, so June 12th, um, and Bob, you're always good about putting it on Facebook too, which is always nice, but I, I'm sure that ultimately will follow too, so we have different streams to, per, to announce that. Yeah, Gina and I typically coordinate um, when those messages go out. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so our next uh, topic is around uh, the uh, school breakfast prices for the 2020-21 uh, period that we discussed earlier. So we'll start with a motion to increase the price of school breakfast at the Captain Samuel Douglas Academy and the Richard Mahaki and Memorial School to $1.75, effective August 1st, 2020. So moved. Second. Thank you. Are there any uh, further topics of discussion around this? I just want to make sure that there is no need to actually increase the price of lunches as well to keep us where we need to be. No, we do, uh, Kelly's required to do an annual calculation and there's a, a ratio. Um, and again, uh, to Amy Cassie's credit, she's been running food service and just doing a tremendous job. So there's no need for us to increase the price this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move to a vote on this. Uh, Rebecca? Rebecca, I. Karen? Karen, I. Allison? Allison, I. Aaron? Aaron, I. And Ken, I. So that carries 5 0 as well. Okay, so we have one more motion quickly. I'm just a reminder, I'm going to send an email out right after this so that we can pick our date for May 13th and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, close on that. Um, with that, uh, the, last, the last motion is motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> Second, I couldn't get to my mute fast enough. Thank you. All right, uh, Rebecca. Rebecca, I. Allison. Allison, I. Um, Karen. Karen, I. Aaron. Aaron, I. And Ken, I. So that moves five zero. Thank you all. Thank you very Thank much, you, everybody. Thank Be you, safe. everyone. Be safe. Bye. Take care.